I sat down with US-based Dr. Amber Halliday last week. Her time rowing here in Oz gave her three world championship titles, sent her to two Olympics, an under-23 world champ title, and she also dominated in cycling with a national title. Here's how our chat went. <laughs> Amber Halliday, massive athletic career, moved into an academic field. Do you want to talk about your accident a little bit to give people some context? Joe has introduced my rowing career and then I did a bit of cycling after that when I was very upset about how we went in Beijing. And just as I was thinking about coming back to rowing to make the London Olympics in 2012, there was one last race and I crashed in this race and I was recovering from a shoulder operation at the time and my theory is that I was just like, ah, oh, save the shoulder, I need to row and came down like that on my temple. It was a severe traumatic brain injury and um, I was like, induced... Like, let's, let's be real here, you nearly died. I nearly died. I was, I was in an induced coma for two or three days. I was in hospital for two months. I was in outpatient rehab for six months after that. It took me nine months to get back to driving. It took me 12 months to get back to working. And so it was a really life-changing in, um, injury and it wasn't like the six to eight weeks that I sort of, there was probably um, a little bit of time early on in, in that recovery from injury that, um, you know, where I was actually thinking, oh, well, this is a bad injury. So maybe it's it is six to eight weeks. Maybe I can still go back to, to rowing. Um, maybe I'll still have time to make the London Olympics, you know, but I eventually came to understand what it means. Hmm. Well, it's pretty impressive that after that you went on to do your PhD. Now you're trying to empower other young women and young athletes to follow their dreams and do the best that they can. So that's, that's pretty cool. After being in denial for so long that I wanted to be in sports psychology, I'm actually now entering sports psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit more about She Thrives in Sport. It is basically everything that I wish I had known when I was first starting elite sport. So it's got a lot of the, the concepts behind performance, a lot of the practical tips, a lot of the, the thinking strategies. But then also we cover um, things that really help with resilience, like optimism is a big one in resilience, to be optimistic, um, to have a balanced mindset, to have a growth mindset. Um, and we also talk about well-being. So we talk about positive emotion and um, we talk a lot about teamwork as well. It's all part of sport. It's all part of performing. It's all part of being happy and setting yourself up to live your life. So I want to touch on something that you said in there about being balanced. A lot of people think to be successful in rowing, you need to be a certain personality, be a little bit obsessed and be a little bit unbalanced. How true is that and how important is balance to being a successful athlete? Well, I, I do agree with you that to be a top athlete like that, you do need to be a little bit obsessed. But, but like I speak about in my course, it needs to be a healthy obsession. You, you need to balance it and you need to recognise the point at which the, the obsession becomes unhelpful. Right. So my, my obsession was, was always about finishing things and I, I probably still have that obsession now. My husband will tell you that um, it's all about, you know, finishing the job that I'm doing or finishing the sentence I'm saying or finishing the meal that I'm eating or whatever. At the time of being an athlete, I had to do everything on the program like right down to the last rep, right down to the last K. I would usually do a few more Ks just to have a break from my coach and, you know, build up those few Ks in the bank that the other girls weren't doing. And um, But, you know, if I was injured, that was off the table. I had to put that obsession aside and, um, and just be sensible and be balanced. It even comes down to the time I guess the time that you're spending training versus your relationships with your friends and family doing 2k's extra every day because I I just enjoyed the break from my coach being in my ear and when we're in the single skull I would go up to the causeway and um, maybe head to the footbridge at least and turn around there and just have a little chill time and think about the session and then row back and it was 2k's you know that 
just meant I was getting a little bit, I was off the water a little bit later than everyone else. Um, and as long as I wasn't running myself late for school or for uni or whatever, that those two Ks every day, they banked up as as well as my riding to training every day. Yeah. Like, so half an hour each way on the bike extra. And then I would do be like 25 minutes each way to the gym. And that, that builds up as well. Reflecting back on my career, I probably needed and thrived on that amount of training when I was younger. But then as I got older, it really, it, it, it is individual and it's also dependent on other factors like age. Yeah, do you think that um, getting older, I'm training probably less than half the amount of minutes or sessions that I did when I was, you know, 21 at uni following a full program. And yet I'm still going significantly faster. How does age and approach to training really affect, you know, your boat speed or the way that you train and getting the most out of your training? To me, it was just about knowing myself better. I knew myself better when I was an older athlete than I did when I was a younger athlete, when I was still trying to figure out everything. When you're old, I mean, this is something that I would encourage no matter what your age to get to know yourself as an athlete, to get to to really tune into things like, oh, that little niggle in my back, that that's a warning sign that something might be coming. I better just back off of this ergo and, you know, I, I can't, I don't think it's a good idea to do the last piece. That was my body telling me something. It's not necessarily about age. It's just about getting to know your body and being insightful about your yourself. How is it best to manage that transition to the next age bracket? How do you shift that mindset from potentially going fastest in your age bracket to then being the bottom of the chain, having to work your way up again? Instead of mindset, let's think expectation. I found it quite important to have a realistic expectation of what was going to happen. I think when I started looking at um, moving age brackets, I thought, oh, you know, will I... If I can test open this nationals, will will I be competitive? And so I went back to the last regatta. Usually the under 23 lightweight race is right next door to the open lightweight race. And you can, with a good degree of certainty, you can look at your time and go, where did I come in the, the senior A race? And that was a good way to realise where I was and perhaps where I wanted, where I needed to be. And then use that as motivation to get there you know it's nothing's perfect when you're comparing times race times like that but um it still gave me hope and it still gave me the motivation to to believe I could do it how important is crew harmony to boat speed do you need to be like socially connected and like best friends to make a boat go fast or can you approach it like a professional relationship I'm lucky to have rode with some really great people in my life and still be really great friends with them. Um, And then there were others that were the more um, professional relationship and we we probably wouldn't have been friends um, outside of that situation. I don't think it's essential. You don't have to be braiding each other's hair to, um, to win a world championship, but it's helpful. You can not like a person. And you can certainly get along with them. You can have the emotional intelligence to deal with them every day. You can have the tolerance for discomfort to put up with, you know, things that they say that you might take exception to, but you just, you you, you can feel close to someone without feeling friendship close to them. I go back to Margs and I, we weren't, I think, particularly good friends, but we had a shared goal and we had a very similar mindset and we were both smart enough to realise that that would go a lot smoother if we got along. That was a different sort of double partner relationship to my double partner relationship with Sally Corsby and both of them worked. As you are now a mother... You, you gain a different perspective on life. Do you feel like you'll be doing things differently from your experience progressing through the rowing pathway here in SA? I don't feel like I could have done anything better or different or if if I had done things differently, like I might not have ended up where I was. So it can work both ways. Most of the time, if you're enjoying the process, it'll get you through to the outcome and it'll get you a good outcome. Sometimes the process can be less than ideal and it might be a motivational technique to think about 
the outcome or to think about the possible outcome and to to motivate yourself from from that in 2001 we had a really like a particularly hard situation i had made the team we had five athletes for a four person boat my coach would use our weight on a daily basis to determine who got in the boat and who didn't and that made it horrible i just sort of thought forward and thought no okay this is all for something all of this pain and all of this embarrassment on a daily basis luckily it worked out that i got through all that i was in the boat we won the world title in 2001 and so yes it works both ways that yeah my <laughs> thought is how would you feel if somebody did that to your son oh i would kick them in the balls like it's awful i wouldn't want anyone to go through that it really messed me up in my eating and feeling like i was worthless because i weighed whatever it came down to like 100 grams more than the girl who ended up being the number 5 person um you know i weighed weighed 100 grams more than her that day and so i was in the single and she was in the quad and you, you know it really it really messed me up if anything with monty my son I mean he's playing soccer at the moment so you know with him I try to maximize his enjoyment by you know enjoying the process it's not just about the outcome like even though I'm talking to my monty who's four like that is something that's easily forgotten as you go further into sport you know if I didn't enjoy the process I probably probably wouldn't have had the outcomes that I did after my accident I was thinking about you know I was coaching you guys at uni I looked back on everything that I did hard in my life, you know, and that kind of, it went back to the the training programs and like the really hard times that I had with my coach, the really embarrassing daily weigh-ins that I failed every day. I used that strength to go forward. Well, if I can do that, then I can do this. So, obviously, you were very very successful as a lightweight. What are the biggest pros and cons to going lightweight and is it worth it? I mean, come on, Joe. Lightweights are awesome. Who would not want to be a lightweight, really? But <laughs> in the very early days, you know, someone would come up to Sally Corsby and say, you know, you're, you know, you're slim. You're not hugely tall as a heavyweight. I think you could go lightweight and just kick ass. And that was the that was the attitude, you know. In the years later, when people were weighing up whether to go lightweight, they went to see the sports scientist and the nutritionist and the doctors that did a lot of calculations, took the body fat, and I don't know what they did, like stirred a potion and came up with a, a formula of what um, weight you could make. And we should definitely pay a lot, of, a lot of attention to the medical evidence and the medical advice. Um, but I think it also, it comes from here as well, that you're, you're not going to be a good lightweight unless you, you want it from here and unless it, it suits you from here and, and things like, are you still growing? You know, like I wouldn't want to tell anyone who is still growing to go, to be a certain weight because you just don't know and you just don't want to mess with their ideas around um, eating and body weight when, when they're still growing and still figuring stuff out. I think it may be tougher and I think it has served me well in the rest of my life. I, I certainly miss my lightweight days. Every, everyone is more physically even and so it comes down to you know, who has it up here and, uh, you know, who approaches their training in a certain way. Like I say, on reflection, I, I quite like that aspect of lightweight, you know, so because we're not think, 7 foot tall. Then it doesn't matter how physiologically blessed you are, it's all up here? It, it's all up here. You could learn some stuff. You could do some mental training. You could do some mental training online. You've obviously spent a lot of time and a lot of energy putting your Sheath Rise and Sport courses together. Who do you think would benefit mm -hmm. most from taking your course? I, I basically wrote it with a particular athlete in mind and she is just starting her elite pathways. In rowing, it would be somebody coming out of school and looking to row beyond school at a university level, at a national level, at an international level. I do try and make it relevant to a, a range of people. So it's not just for rowing? 
No, not just for rowing. You know, when you put together a course like this, you realise like what a nice, straightforward sport rowing is. As, as my coach, um, Andrew Stunnell, actually actually used to tell me, like, you just can't give the selectors a reason not to select you. So basically win everything, win it by a good margin <laughs> and in seat racing, like, minimise the losing margins as much as you can. That's the way to get selected. You don't give the selectors a reason not to select you. I tried to think about that when I was putting together the course and even though it's from my point of view, it's from a rowing point of view, I also tried to incorporate my experience in cycling, which was similar but different. It had a different dynamic and I certainly drew on that experience for my lessons around teamwork. How would somebody go about accessing your resource for She Thrives in Sport? It's just a matter of going to shethrivesinsport.com. I'm putting together a course for the coaches of female athletes just at the beginning of their coaching pathway and um, and also for parents of female athletes. So they're to come. But the I Thrive course for female athletes is my signature course and it's live. Thank you for taking John? the time. Aww. <laughs> uh, I don't even know how to do it. How do your kids do it like this? Okay, well, make me look cool. Always, always. <laughs>